but I do believe it's bad luck if you bring rain jackets out on drive and <laughs> and you don't and you put them on just at the slightest drop of rain and chase the rain away so I've left everything back home we'll see maybe that's good luck for us today A lovely 34 degrees centigrade. Sure. Thirty-four, what does that convert to Fahrenheit? I think it's somewhere in the nineties, maybe ninety-five. Darby, what do you think after the lions we head past a couple of dams, maybe we'll get some animals either sleeping in the water or yes, some coming for a drink. Maybe go check twin dams after here and then work our way on. Some baboon tracks on the road. Should we hit the right here? Just do a loop to the left. Folks, we'll see you a little bit later. We're gonna go find those lines for you. And we'll see you shortly for an update. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, welcome to our hot and steamy South Africa for this sunset safari. A uh, big welcome to Mountain View, Princess Anne. Oh dear. Glenwood and White Oaks Elementary Schools and uh, great to have you all on board. So for the next 45 minutes, this is your very own private safari. So please ask me questions. I'd love to hear from you. Of course, we've got Taylor out on foot. We've got FW out in the other car. I uh, know FW's gone to look for some lions. I'm busy heading towards the east of our traverse area to try and look for a leopard. Now we can hear in the distance there and I'm trying to see what it is. But this is Safari Live.
Okay, let's get going. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have my good friend Viem on camera with me, and we're in search of all the wonderful creatures. As I was saying, uh, if you're looking for lions, I'm going to go head down towards the east of our traverse area, which is about seven or eight kilometers that way, uh, where we found a young male leopard this morning. I'm hoping we're going to be able to find him again this afternoon. But of course, being live, we can never plan or script what's going to happen next. So that is the wonderful thing. Uh, hopefully, we find you all the animals. Remember that. Remember to send me questions and lots of them, please. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And you don't only have to ask questions about lions and leopards, you can ask about trees, bugs, birds, uh, the weather even, uh, we'll be happy to oblige. What is that, Fiam? On top of that fallen ruler, is that a weird branch or is that a bird of prey? It's a weird branch. Uh, it is a, a bird-like branch. We get also lion-like branches and uh, leopard-like stumps and leopard and crocodile-like crocodile-like branches as well. Yes, Viem is correct. Uh, don't think we're going to see any crocodiles at the moment. We've just come out of a very big drought. Uh, I think they're all that side of the world where there's a bit more water. Now this is always a good area when we pass through here to look for a female leopard called Tandi who's got a baby at the moment but we haven't seen her for quite some time apparently she's been deep in the north but we're going to keep on adventuring down to the east while we do that uh, let's go see what Taylor's up to on foot Good afternoon and welcome. Well, we're out here walking around in the wilderness and I hope you're ready to have a look at the smaller creatures that I have to show you. Now, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me this afternoon, we've got Zander. I haven't said that name in such a long time because we call him Eggsy here. And then of course, we've got the almighty protector, Herbert, who's making sure that we stay safe and sound. Now. It's very hot out here, as I'm sure everybody else has mentioned. But look at this massive tree that's been pushed down by the elephants. You'll probably see Herbert at the back as he is tipping over bits of bark to look for scorpions and all sorts of wonderful things. Now, the elephants have pushed this tree over many, many, many years ago. And they would have pushed it over to try and get to the tops of the leaves that their trunks could not reach. And also, they like to feed on the roots of the trees. Now, I've got something to show you, but it means we've got to go over here to a, to a Muruhula tree that is still alive. Let's take a little stroll this way. And you can see that there are lots and lots of marula trees around here. Hello, Jesus. You were wondering what the temperature is and how hot it is. It's hot, hot, hot. It's about 95 degree Fahrenheit. So you, every now and then you'll see all the presenters with a nice shiny face. It's not makeup. It's just the sweat because it is so hot. Now, have a look here at the lovely bark on this beautiful big tree. And if you go all way up you should see the lovely leaves now like I said this tree is still alive but when this marula tree starts to get its fruit which looks like this but this fruit is still a young one and while it's not going to taste very nice it's a little bit too early in the year for us to eat but they get quite big they get to about that size and once they drop on the ground they go nice and yellow after a few days and they become ripe and you can eat them they're really delicious but the elephants absolutely love the fruit of this tree so what they will do sometimes they come up to it when it's found a female tree because it's only the girl trees that have the fruit the boy trees they don't make any fruit and it'll put its trunk up on the tree and push with its head and you won't believe it the whole tree shakes and a shower of all these fruits fall to the ground and they will eat them but we're going to open one up now let's see if I can get a knife out now remember if you are handling a knife you must make sure that your mom or dad are always there to help you because you don't want to cut yourself 
luckily I'm a big enough girl now that I can use a knife all on my own. Let's see if this will open it. Oh, it's so tough. It's so tough. You see, it's so hard. Now it's got a big stone in the middle. Oh. Let's try and slice some of the, the flesh away. You can see. So there isn't much flesh on this fruit. So what you have to do is when it gets a little bit bigger and, and, and when it gets ripe, and that's normally in about February or March, you take it, you go, and you bite it with your teeth, and you, you twist it, and then you pull the top piece off. Then you use both fingers. Let's put the knife away though. No, no it's not. It's very difficult to put that back in. Then you take both fingers and you squeeze the pip out. And then you and you suck on it. And what it does is that all the juices and all the pulp gets into your mouth. And it's sweet. It's a little bit sour. It's so tasty. And it's very high in vitamin C and other nutrients. So maybe if you're walking around and you feel, oh, I'm hot. I'm a little bit tired today. And you feel like you haven't got any energy. It's good to carry a couple of ripe marula fruits with you and just pop them in your mouth and suck on them and you'll be good to go. So like I said, it's not just the elephants that like this fruit. I like it. The baboons like it. The warthogs like it. Everything will eat the fruit of the marula tree. So it's a race. So you'll see in February and March, if you're still watching, I'll be running around the open areas, picking up the fruits, putting it in bags and taking it back home to keep so that I have my own stash so that I can munch on them. They're really, really quite delicious. Now, Deshaun, you are wondering what kind of elephants can push these trees down. So, we have got a species of elephant called the African elephant. So, it's much bigger than the, than the Asian elephant, and it occurs all over Africa. Now, this big tree was probably pushed down by an elephant bull, so a boy elephant, and they can get really, 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 really big. So, imagine... What we'll try and actually do is we'll actually try and find a, a part of a tree that an elephant has rubbed and I'll stand next to it so we can show you how tall an elephant gets. But imagine it has to be a massive animal to be able to push down a big tree like this. Maybe it wasn't just one elephant. Maybe it was a few elephants that pushed down this tree and they would have eaten all the leaves and all the branches and the fruit. Now, Nicholas, you are wondering, I used the word pulp, and you're wondering what pulp is. So pulp is, you know, sometimes when your mom gives you orange juice in a glass, and you've got all the nice, clear, thin orange juice at the top, and you get to the bottom, and you have bits of orange juice with actual pieces of orange. That is the pulp. So it's liquidy, but it also has a little bit of pieces of fruit in it as well. So that's what I mean when I say the pulp. But maybe one day, if you ever get to come to Africa, and you go on a safari, you have to ask your guide to show you a marula tree, and if you're lucky enough in the right time of the year, you've got to be able to try and taste one as well. They are so delicious. It's my favorite fruit in, out of all the trees in the bush. So what we... Oh. <laughs> So what we're going to do just now, it's going to be quite exciting. We are going to take the view of an eagle. Are you ready to see what a bird sees? I hope you are because this is going to be very, very exciting. You can actually see the drone is above us now. Can you see it flying around? Look at that. Past the big clouds. Right, now in a moment, you should be able to see us all the way down on the ground. Eggsy, you have to wave. Eggsy and I are waving. You can see the big tree. We're standing on the other side. Isn't that amazing? So now you can see all the big trees that the elephants haven't pushed over yet, but they still could be pushed over by them in, in the up and coming season. And if you were to go very, very, very high, you would actually be able to see all the paths 
pathways that the animals have made and are using to walk around on. So they don't just use the roads that we use, they also have their own pathways that they use every single day. And when we're out walking, they make for great pathways to follow because there's not lots of thorns and obstructions and fallen trees over them. So it's really nice. Isn't this cool? How you can now pretend that you're an eagle? Oh, look, we're waving again. Waving to everybody who's watching. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> that is an amazing piece of equipment. <laughs> Eggsy's a little bit wobbly today because he's got a tall antenna sticking out of his back. Amazing how this drone is able to follow us like this. We have to be careful of the trees though. I don't know how good Connor's flying skills are to be able to dash in between the trees. And finally we have moved to some fun wonderful shades. So not only does the marula tree provide fruit and food like the leaves and the bark and the roots of the tree that the animals can feed on but this is probably one of the more important things is that it provides shade look we've got three marula trees in front of us and look how much shade there is i'm standing a couple of feet away from that tree and i'm still oh, hidden from the sun and that's also very important leopards like to sleep up in the tops of these trees lions will be laying down here on the ground trying to keep nice and cool on a hot day like today and even some antelope maybe a buffalo or two resting and uh, rechewing their food uh, because they'd have to do that because they've got four stomachs and for four chambers in their stomachs rather so it's important to have big trees around and it's good to know that the elephants haven't pushed them all down yet but you'll see lots and lots of elephants pushing trees down Ah, speaking of cats that like to sleep under the shade of marula trees, let's go across to Evia, who's got some lions for you. Good afternoon, folks. I'm FW, and with me I've got Darby on camera, and we have found the big cats we were planning on finding for this afternoon. Nice Nkahuma pride visual of two of the females some of the cubs are in very thick bush at the moment trying to stay out of the heat the females are luckily heads heads up and scanning around looking at a couple of things around us I think more more so using the breeze to cool down a little bit Keegan, you are asking if I've ever been hurt by an animal before. <laughs> I actually got hurt today. I got stung by a bee. <laughs> I went for a swim this afternoon to try and lift the heat and as I got out the pool I got stung under my arm. So yeah, I have been hurt by a couple of different ones. Um, scorpions as well before, but mostly bees. Lucky, Luckily nothing big scary and hairy that could have done a lot of damage and luckily I'm not allergic to bees yeah hopefully it'll stay that way for for a long time hopefully I'll get through my entire guiding career without getting into any big trouble with any of the hairy and scary ones Anna, you are asking if we're going to see any of the prey animals that the lions would prey on in our area. Well, hopefully we will. As we move around during the drive, we will hopefully bump into some of the prey animals, some of the herbivores, something like impala, or water buck, maybe a buffalo. So yeah, we've got time. We'll explore and see if we can get lucky.
Yeah, deal. You would like to know who hunts the food. Now, a lot of people think it's only the lionesses that hunt, but males do hunt. Males sometimes hunt on their own if they nomads or moving around, patrolling their territory, and there are no females around, then they will have to look after themselves. So, yeah, definitely both of the sexes do the hunting. Often it's only the females that do. Often it's only the females that do hunt because the males are patrolling their territory. But while we keep looking at these guys and see what they're up to, we're going to head over to Brent on Cheetah Plains and see what he's got there for you. Now this leopard we found this morning is really, really far into our traverse area. So I still haven't even got to the last spot we saw him. So I am going a little bit quicker than what I normally would. Now he's a young male, he's about just under 14 months old. So his mom has left him in that area while she goes off to try find some dinner. So there's a really good chance he still should be in that area. But before we get there, I wanna take a quick swing past the waterhole, see if maybe, hopefully, some elephants have returned. I haven't seen elephants in a while. They've all spread out after the rain. So, fingers crossed. Whoa, big pump. Approaching the waterhole now. No sign of any elephants. Well, it's all quiet here at the waterhole. Here we go, nothing happening. Now, Peyton, hello Peyton. Peyton is wondering what leopards eat. Well, Peyton, they eat small to medium sized antelope. So anything from about, or they, they'll eat anything from about the size of a, a hare or a rabbit, all the way through uh, to something bigger than what a white-tailed deer is from a size point of view for you in the States. But uh, they are great survivors. They'll even eat insects, birds, uh, but all of what they eat is meat. Okay, so nothing happening at the waterhole. So we'll carry on. Not even a sign of fresh elephant tracks. Now, it's been so hot today that when I was here this morning, there was water in here, and it's a dried up. Looks like there's been a warthog wallowing in it, so he's had a mud bath. And that could have helped with the water disappear. Hello Nicholas. Nicholas would like to know why it's so hot. Well, Nicholas, because we live in a hot part of the world. It's about 95 degrees Fahrenheit today, which is a pretty average hot summer's day out here. Uh, we can go up as hot as 110 uh, from time to time, but it's not too bad today. There's a little bit of a breeze keeping us cool. We've got lots of sun cream on. Oh, and there's Ephraim. Let's see what he is looking at. And he's doing the same thing as me, looking for the leopards. I oh, know it's Michael, not Ephraim. So I'm going to have a quick chat with Michael. Hello, Michael. How are you doing? Um, have you gone that side yet? No. I'm going to go have a look. No. Yeah. Drove past there after the end of the morning. Yeah. She was still Same spot under the shed. Perfect! Let's go find a leopard. Yay! Good luck, Good luck to you too, sir. 
Okay, let's go have a look if we can find this leopard again. I'm heading back towards where he was and uh, very close to where we found him early this morning. Hello, Dominique. Uh, Dominique would like to know, what's it like to be out in the wild with animals? Is it fun? Indeed it is, Dominique, and I love it. Uh, it's lots of fun following the animals as they do their thing out here. And not only is it fun, but you get to learn at the same time. So you get to learn lots about the animals and uh, lots about the plants and the flowers and the bugs and the snakes and the lizards and everything. So yes, I think it's lots of fun, Dominique. Okay, getting into that area. So if I can't find him with the car, what I'll do is I'll go walk and see if I can find him on foot. Just want to make sure we don't see his footprints in this area. So I hope all of you guys are my leopard luck this afternoon. So while we look for the second biggest cat in Africa, let's go back to the biggest with Effia. Welcome back. We had one lioness move a little bit from where they were laying down and she has stopped us from moving. She's pinned us down. She's right next to our vehicle. So we are being a little bit more quiet and trying to move as little as possible. Look how close that is. You could almost touch it if you wanted to. That would have been a very bad move, but if you're really brave, you can be my guest. So yeah, we'll have to sit here for a little bit and not move much. Noah, you are asking if the lions ever chased the jeeps. Young lions have chased me around before. They, I don't know if they look at, at the back lights, especially at night when you're moving away from them, and they see the back lights. Here's another lioness coming in. Oh, I hope they don't sit all around us. Maybe they're looking for the vehicle's shade. But yeah, no, little cubs or bigger cubs find interest in everything. They, they try and investigate everything and they do every now and then just run after the vehicle. But with no intention to harm anyone, it's just playfulness. <laughs> I think we're going to be here for a while. Thankfully she's moving off. Hopefully the other one follows her and we can move around and try and show you some of the other lions that's in the area. They're scattered all, all over the place with um, everyone trying to find a bit of shade. Linnea, you are asking when lions mostly eat. Mostly at night is when they go out and hunt. They see a little bit better, or a lot better than other animals do, and better than we would see at night. So it's their advantage to take and use that advantage to go and hunt, try and get closer to animals. And if they catch something, depending on the size, let's say they catch a big buffalo, they might spend a day or two eating on it. So then they'll eat continuously throughout the time. They'll fill themselves up go and rest, digest a little bit and then move on, go back and eat later again. So any time of the day if they have a kill they'll eat but 
when they get the, most of their kills, night time is a better time for them to, to utilize that. Vincent, you are asking if I've ever seen lions fight. I've never seen two male lions fight for territory. Um, but I have seen them competing at a kill and it does get quite intense. There's a lot of slaps being handed around. Look at that cub coming to mum or aunt. Let's see, maybe it might try and get a drink, get some milk from one of the two. Um, yeah, so I've never seen a full-on fight where it was too serious, just a bit of competition at a, at a meal. Look at those faces together. Another cub is coming out. Michael, <clears throat> you would like to know what type of animals lions would eat. All your medium to bigger sized prey. So that could vary from something like an impala all the way up to a buffalo. And all the ones in between zebra, wildebeest, kudu as a couple of examples. face isn't that amazing we're gonna quickly head over to Brent he's got a spotted surprise look at this so we found this young male leopard again and the best thing about young leopards is they're very playful and he's got a buddy we can't really see but just if we look under his paw he's caught a tortoise I think you call them turtles in America and there we go a tortoise and you can see his claw out there and he's holding the poor tortoise down now it's unlikely that his jaws are going to be strong enough to break the carapace of the tortoise but it is a good toy for a young leopard and you will often play with it for a while keep him entertained while mom's away looking for dinner but he's falling asleep while he's got the tortoise under his paw. Now, Aubrey would like to know, am I scared around lions or other big animals? Uh, I'm not scared, Aubrey. Uh, I'm lucky I've grown up in the bush around surrounded by these animals but I do have a lot of respect for them so if they tell me they're upset with their body language I leave them alone I'll move away so I'm not scared I've got lots of respect for them though Now Amri wants to know, do the animals ever get aggressive? Amri sometimes, but generally they get aggressive with each other, not with us. And uh, they, animals, like people, will tell you when they're upset. And when they're upset, we stay away. And they tell us via their body language. So if his ears were flat and his tail was swishing from side to side, it would tell me he was an angry leopard and I shouldn't go too close. I should probably leave him alone. But his body language is telling me he's a very relaxed leopard. So it's fine to sit and watch him. Hi Jalen. Jalen would like to know how long do leopards live? Well Jalen, uh, if you're a male leopard, you're very old if you get to 14 years old. Uh, that's about the top sort of age for a male leopard. Female leopards, 
will live a little bit longer uh, up to around 16 but 16 is a very old leopard normally male leopards 12 to 13 females 14 to 16 now is he sleeping on top of the door? No, he's not sleeping quite. He might be. <laughs> Little troublemaker. That's the wonderful thing about following uh, leopards of this age. You could almost call them teenage leopards. They're always off and after things. Deshaun would like to know, is the leopard going to eat the turtle? Uh, I think that turtle is too well protected for a young leopard. His jaws aren't quite strong enough. But if he manages to grab hold of its head or any of its legs, if they pop him out, uh, it will definitely grab and eat what it can. Of So... So we're going to sit here see what he, to see what he does next with the turtle. While we do that, let's go see. Oh, look, he's going to sleep on top of the turtle. <laughs> While he snoozes, let's go to Taylor, who's got a bird in a nest. So you won't believe what happened this morning. I was driving around looking for lions and we came around the corner and I looked on the ground and I noticed an eggshell, but we'll show you that in a moment. And I couldn't work out where the nest was. And now that we're walking around and going a little bit slower than what you would go when you're driving in the cars, we looked up to the top of this tree and we found an African green pigeon sitting on its nest. Now, these eggs must have just hatched probably last night or late in the afternoon yesterday because when I saw them in the morning, the shells were still quite intact. But come and have a look what I've got to show you now. So here I was, driving around, looking, and I went, ah, eggshells. And I saw one. And then, it wasn't squashed like this though. This is now after a car has come through and driven over it. But don't worry, the babies are inside the nest. There was just a small hole. And I couldn't work out where they are. So there must be two chicks because there's another eggshell over here. Look at this. Another one. So only two eggshells, which must mean that they have two little babies inside that nest. And now that is quite common for these birds to have two eggs. And it takes them about two weeks before those eggs will hatch. And tiny little baby chicks will come out with no feathers on their bodies, their eyes closed, and they have to rely completely on their mom to keep them warm, to feed them, and... I reckon in the next few days you have to keep watching. Hopefully we're going to see them start to grow and develop their feathers. And then after another two weeks, they'll be big and strong enough. They'll be flapping their wings and getting ready to leave the nest. But let's see what Herbie's got. He's just pointed out something to us. Now I hope you're wondering how tall are those trees? They're quite big. A marula tree, remember these are the same marula trees that we saw earlier, and they can get to 22 meters tall. I am not sure what the conversion is in feet. I'm terrible. But I've got something else. Now I need to find it. Eggsy, can you see right here? Look at that. Can you see that tiny little, little lizard? It actually looks like it's probably a very, very young skink. It's got a bright orange tail. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how Herbert... Ma I'm going to just turn it again. Oh! And off it jumped, just like that. It had had enough of us, and it decided it was going to see if it was a bird and see if it could fly. But it couldn't fly, but it was almost like a cat, like it had nine lives because it landed straight onto its feet. So it'll be all right. I'm not worried about it. And it's got very good camouflage at that young age that it is able, of course, to hide under any piece of branch or bark or even just on the sand. It'll be okay. But now I've got something else to show you. Look what is in my hand. Oh no, the wind is blowing. Come back here, okay, we'll get that one now. Now I have a question for all of you. What 
animal, we'll call it an animal, do you think these claws belong to? You're going to have to ask your teacher to send through your answers and I'll be waiting to hear. So what do you think, who do you think these pincers belong to? And while you guess, I'm going to pick up the thing that I dropped. Here we go. Look at this. Now this was a butterfly. I found it. It had died and something has eaten its head. So I'm not sure what happened there, but it doesn't have a head anymore. But this is a butterfly called an African migrant. And we're so lucky to actually have found one that was perfectly intact, except it was just missing its head. Now it hasn't got too many colors. Look at that beautiful sort of sheen, a little bit green. It almost looks like a pearl, don't you think, that you find in an oyster? I think it is so beautiful. Have you got any questions yet? Who's crawling on my leg? There's a little bee or a fly of some sort crawling on my leg. Have you got any answers yet for who these pincers belong to? Look at all those little hairs. Oh, so I believe all the children who are watching from Glenwood Elementary, you have guessed either a crab or a scorpion. Now, it could definitely be a crab because even though we're not near an ocean, you get freshwater crabs and we occasionally see them in the mud wallows. But your second guess was correct. It is indeed a scorpion. Now, this, I, we have to have a look here down here again. Unfortunately, I may have broken the pincers. Scorpion wouldn't have been a very venomous scorpion. So when I say venomous, it has a sting on the end of its tail. And the sting, if it penetrates through your skin, if it stings you, that venom, that toxin will go into your blood and it can sometimes make you sick. But luckily, this one was not a venomous one. So this one, you to use its big claws, its big pincers, to actually run after and catch maybe millipedes or any other little insects, maybe even a little lizard like we just saw, something like that. Now, what do you think has eaten this? Because there's a lot of things out here that would eat a scorpion from birds. But where I found it was underneath a piece of wood, fallen tree and a bit of bark. So I think that an animal called a honey badger, which is the most ferocious animal in the African bush, it even makes lions put its tail between its legs and run for cover. Can you believe it? So it almost looks like a very, very angry skunk. But I would say a Tasmanian animal crossed with a skunk. And I think that that honey badger was out foraging underneath all the wood, underneath the bar and well scorpions are one of their favorite things to eat but the pincers aren't very tasty and normally they'll sometimes even leave the sting behind but the rest of it is lovely and nutritious bye bye <laughs>I believe that all of you who are watching from White Oaks Elementary, you are wondering if there are lots of scorpions around. Yes, there are, but you have to look for them. They, remember, they're quite small. They're not big and strong like a lion or a leopard or a hyena. They've got a hard way because there are lots of different things that are going to try and eat them. So if you want to find a scorpion, the best time is to actually look at night time because they are nocturnal. So if you remember from watching yesterday, nocturnal means that they are nighttime creatures. They don't like to come out during the day. But if you go and look, you remember that big marula tree we just had a look at? If you look underneath all the bits of bark and things like that, you'll probably find one trying to keep keep away from the sun. So yes, you've just got to look hard enough and we're going to keep looking for a scorpion. But hopefully the next time you come back to us, I'll have a scorpion that's alive and wriggling around. But we're going to go back across to those lions who used to be using the shade of Evia's vehicle. All right. We had a bit of movement. There's a female that's in this thicket. Just to the right of the other lionesses and the two cubs that are sleeping. She stood up and moved a bit. I think she's going to move away from where she's standing at the moment. So for a minute or two, she's going to come. Oh, there she's coming. Come, come a little bit more. Keep coming. There we go. 
slowly but surely. Matthew, you would like to know if there is only one male lion in the pride. At the moment there is no male with them. But the group of males that the territory that we are in at the moment is a group of four, if I'm not mistaken. And they are called the Birmingham males. Look at this one having a little bit of a drink, trying to get, get some milk. <laughs> Awesome. With regards to males, their group sizes differ. You do get solitary males that run territories that are the dominant males, but they've got much more success when they're in groups, in coalitions of maybe two to four males, five males, that, um, that just helps helps them fight off any intruders or anyone that want, wants to challenge them and take over the territory that they hold. It's very important for them to hold their territory for as long as they can. It is very important for them to hold their territory as long as they can to get these cubs a chance to grow up and reach some form of maturity before they they get kicked out um, white oaks elementary you would like to know how long lions sleep for they can sleep up to 18 hours out of a day that is a serious amount of sleeping i wouldn't mind sleeping eight hour, 18 hours a day darvi what do you think oh, that'll be fun uh, won't get much done but it'll be great as long as it's nice and cool. L Liam, you would like to know why lions like the shade so much. I think it's purely just to stay cool. They want to stay cool, they don't want to use any energy have the sun draining them from any energy and it's just more comfortable it's in the shade it's same if you if you on your summer break or something and you it's a hot day out there you don't want to spend too much time in the sun you would rather hide yourself in the shade and protect yourself from the sun white oaks you would like to know how long the cubs would stay with their mother female cubs would stay or most likely stay their entire lives they'll stay in the pride and they keep the pride growing and moving forward f into the future with breeding and so on males get kicked out so males at around two and a half years to three years their fathers, the dominant males, push them out. And that is a very good way of getting their own genetics spread further into these wilderness areas. So these guys will become no nomads for a while. They'll spend time on their own, moving around, hiding from other males, and try and avoid being cornered by any of the dominant males of other areas until they are one day strong enough to challenge one and maybe push him or the group out. They'll often find other males that were pushed out as well and they'll form coalitions and work together to survive.
before we say goodbye I just want to show you an interesting beetle look at how tiny this beetle is it's called a long horn beetle just look at it, that amazing coloring and the spots on the body to all the kids that joined us today it has been lovely having you with us we hope you have a lovely day going forward we are going to head over to Brent and see what he's up to <laughs> We are busy witnessing the world's slowest getaway as the tortoise crawls from young Vutumi's gr grasp but as I said not very quickly it is definitely the world's slowest getaway but it seems like this young male leopard has lost interest in the speaks hinged tortoise it looks like he's about to go to sleep again Isn't that beautiful? We're looking through some gnarled red bush willow roots to, well, there were some peering eyes, but now they're very heavy eyes. <laughs> His head grows lower. Now, oh, there we now he's gone completely flat. Will the tortoise take its chance? Oh, I see a bit of head movement from the tortoise. Is he going to escape? Let's try get move a little bit to get a different view. How's that for him? Can you get the tortoise there? There we go. We can see it making his not so fast dash to freedom. So what's probably happened here is that tortoise has got itself underneath that bush willow branch and it is feeling a lot safer there than exposed and we did see that young leopard use the the tortoise as a pillow a little earlier and of course quite well protected so there he is he's breathing quite heavily as well but wouldn't you be if you were being used as a toy Poor tortoises, they do come across uh, these situations far more often than they would like. As I said, fortunately, at his age, I don't think he's got the bite force to crack open that tortoise's carapace. Can't see any wounds. No, it's an unbelievable how deep they are able to tuck themselves in. Uh, there he is. Just keeping a careful eye on the tortoise. Oh, and there's a carrion fly on the stalk of grass there as well. You can see that red head, often associated with carcasses, but uh, there might be some leopard scat around that would also attract that particular fly species. It's the one it's the one fly you really don't want to land on you because it's either been on a predator dung or inside a rotting corpse. Oh, well, there's more than one. So there's definitely dung around. And you've got two carrion flies around. Is the tortoise having a snack? I thought he might stop for... Oh, no, it's just the wind blowing the grass towards him. I was about to say, a very relax, a relaxed tortoise in that situation if he stopped to snack on a piece of grass. And we can see there's a little bit of love grass in front of him. Oh, there we go. There we go. He's making his dash. As I get the world's slowest getaway ever. Well, Susie says, go, little tortoise, go. Yes, Susie, he's just not going very fast. Now, he's hoping that 
this young leopard has decided that it's not worth pursuing, it's too hot, there's no reward at the end. And tortoise seems to take two steps every four minutes. I really think we should call it VM the tortoise two step. There we go, you can see breathing quite heavily, showing the heat. Well, Thomas in Pennsylvania says, The Leopard and the Tortoise. It sounds like a children's book. Well, Thomas, maybe you should write the book. The Leopard and the Tortoise. I definitely think it almost sounds like an African folklore. I I, there might even be one if I go do some research. Look how heavily that tortoise is breathing. Oh, there we go. Two-step Tony's taken two more steps. And the world's slowest getaway continues. Oh, oh two-step, you've created, you've, you've caused too much noise, two-step. You have been spotted. I think two-step Tony the tortoise needs to work on his getaways. If you keep walking in that direction, two-step, you are definitely going to be spotted and he's being watched. But whether the game of play with the tortoise is over for young Vatumi or not, we shall be seeing all oh, two steps. Uh, definitely living up to his name now. He's hitting it at a rate of knots. Please don't come hide underneath my car, two-step Tony. Here he goes. <laughs> Shame. Well, he's, he's moving now. He is heading straight towards us. Careful, Vim, the tortoise is charging. But I think the heat and the lack of reward has uh, left young Vatomi thinking, you know what, Tony, off you go. Now, unfortunately for two-step Tony, his getaway isn't too far, so if the leopard changes his mind, it's a simple hop and a skip and back into the land of trouble for the poor Speaks hinged tortoise I decided to call Tony. Two-step. Well, imagine what he's going to say to all the t other tortoises tonight. You're not going to believe a leopard used me as a pillow. Seems like young Vatomi is more distracted by the stable flies that are nipping at his ears. Now, wow. Captain Awesome, I don't know if I can actually say this out loud because it is... Oof, it's very cheesy. Captain Orson says, um, let's celebrate. I can't believe I said that. I'm going to hide my head now. I can't believe I said that on a live feed. Let's celebrate. I'm never, I'm never saying that again. My goodness. There we go. Two steps on the move. He's now charging Ephraim from Cheetah Plains. Ephraim, careful, Mfo. It's coming. It's big danger. <laughs> Oh, look, and Two Step is even causing Ephraim to move his vehicle. Ephraim <laughs> is giving Two Step a chance. Oh, he's trying to get under to Ephraim's car. Off he goes. Come on. Ephraim's making space for Two Step to uh, make his getaway. Yes. Oh no, yes. so no, the problem is the tortoise is looking at that, the dark shade under the vehicles and thinking that's a good spot to get away from a leopard. But, <laughs> oh no, he's heading for Mike now. 
and Mike unfortunately is in a position where he can't move. Two step, that is a terrible place. That is worse than being in a leopard's jaws under a Land Cruiser. Oh, and next to the tire. That is possibly the worst place two step Tony could have gone. <laughs> oh, we can't see. Now, because it's under the car, Votomi is far more interested in it. Well, Mike's game drive is going to be here for the rest of the day, it seems. He cannot move while Two Step is hiding under his Land Cruiser. Votomi has decided Two Step is far more interesting now that he's under the car than under the log. And let's go see what it looks like from the other side. <laughs> now, this is one of those, <laughs> those amazing things that you can't ever plan. And that's the joy of being live. Remember, um, if you've just joined us and you're not sure and you want to ask us a question about Two Step Tony and Vitomi the Leopard, uh, you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, I have had leopard cubs go under my car before. Never to fetch a tortoise, though. I was trying to see if I could see the tortoise under Mike's vehicle. Let me wear my binoculars. I can't see where Two Step Tony's gone. <laughs> oh, biting flies again. Now, this is one of the reasons if you get the opportunity, if you find a young male leopard, you must always stick with them. They are always up to shenanigans. Even in the heat, they are at that age, especially at this age, where they're so easily entertained or distracted by all sorts of things. Now, you'll find an adult leopard will just generally completely ignore a tortoise, walk straight past it, unless they're extremely hungry. I'm just trying to see if I can see the tortoise now. I've lost sight of it. Bite, bite. Bite, bite of the biting fly. VM spotted the tortoise. Oh, he's on the move. He might come out from under the car. I'm just trying to see if we can spot him again. Okay, we're going to try reposition to see if we can find the tortoise again. We're going to get back a bit, VM. A little bit more. Let's go around this way, maybe forward.
Let's see. Is that him there? I can't see him under the car at all. Maybe he's a climbing tortoise and he's decided to climb into the undercarriage of Mark's vehicle. While we keep searching for two-stepping Tony the tortoise, uh, let's go see what the lions are up to with FW. We have still got some very sleepy lions. It's just one cub that's drinking from mum at the moment. We haven't even had a chance to move the vehicle. We've got a lioness right next to us. Fast asleep, lights out. So I don't think we're going anywhere anytime soon unless she decides to, to get up and move off. So we've got two cubs that we have visual of at the moment. Um, I don't know if any of the viewers can help me with sexing of the cubs, the six cubs. I don't have, not being in the area too often, I don't know the sexes of the cubs. And it would lo be lovely if you could give me a hand with that. There's a third cub coming out now, doing a bit of lion yoga, stretching itself out. Andreas, you would like to know if the animals suffer from the heat as much as us humans do. I think they do. Some animals like buffalo or rhino, elephants, they'll cool themselves down with going into mud and throwing themselves with mud in the case of elephants and the others will just roll around in mud. So that's a way for them to, to soothe themselves from the heat. Animals like lion and leopard, they'll try and minimize their movement during the heat of the day, do as little as possible, and then when it cools down, move around. Look at this cub greeting when it, this female saying hello, S snarling a bit at the vehicle. The females will allow each other's cubs to suckle from them. So this one that's lying next to the vehicle might have been mum, but just not being able to get to mum, they'll maybe try with another female. Something's got their attention. They've just lifted their heads. I'm just having a look around. What has got them to lift their heads? I don't hear any movement of anything. Let's wait a minute or two and see if they decide to get up. If they get up and start moving, oh, no, flopping down again. Daniel, thank you very much for that information. So it is one male cub and five female cubs in this group. I think that's very good news for this pride, that the female cubs will just keep growing this pride and maybe one day they'll end up as a mega pride. Mega prides are prides that have relatively big numbers. There's one in particular in the Kruger Park that's quite well known they've got some white lions in that group as well they are on a, the area is around a road that's called the S100 
which is close to the Satara rest camp in the Kruger National Park. I think they are about 30 odd lions in that pride. Shame Cub, I would love to have moved to give you a chance to drink from mum there, but we're going to cause trouble if we do. Folks, while we patiently wait for this lioness to move to give us a chance to to move on and go and search for some other stuff, we're going to head over to Taylor with some of the smaller creatures on Bushwalk. Now this is a bizarre scene that we're looking at. And if you're wondering why, it's because when do you ever see a scorpion out during the day Especially one that has decided to climb up on top of this plant. Most of us, or most of the scorpions, sorry, not most of us, are nocturnal. And they only really come out at night to go around and do their business. So, the weather has also started to change. The wind has picked up. The clouds are coming over. I wonder if this scorpion perhaps know that there is rain on the way. And that's why it has decided to come out of its burrow or from on the ground somewhere, maybe under a piece of bark, and decided to climb higher ground. Now, I'm not sure, I can obviously only speculate, but I think that that is really, really interesting. Now, we see the scorpion quite often. This is the Ostipicantha asper species of scorpion. It doesn't really have a, a common name. I think, you, I think their common name could be a common natal or something ridiculous like that. But isn't it beautiful and very easy to identify because of its dark body with its almost yellowish legs to it and not very big and not a potent sting on the end of it either. But I just find this absolutely fascinating. And look at that view. I mean, this is a view of a scorpion that you don't often get to get. Normally it's the backdrop is always just sand or a tree. But to have a scorpion and a bit of blue sky in it as well, well, that's really, really incredible. And I wonder what it's doing up here. Sitting very, very still, blowing as you can see how the wind is picked up. That is just absolutely amazing. Now I'm so sad that the children are not watching anymore from the various schools because they were absolutely dying to see a scorpion. But hopefully they will be able to find another one, maybe tomorrow, to show them if they are joining us for another drive. But it's nice to see a scorpion again, and, and to also just to find one out in the open. I mean, you know, we typically go and we turn over fallen, uh, fallen trees, the bits of bark that are dangling off it, and we have a look underneath there. But that was such a surprise to find one just sitting on the stalk of this plant. Now I'm sure the scorpions though must be quite full at the moment because of all the insects and things that are roaming around. There's definitely no shortage of millipedes at the moment. We've been finding a lot of the, the entrances of the scorpions burrows. There's lots and lots of the exoskeletons of the millipedes hanging around outside there. And I don't know if you know this, if there isn't really any food source around, a scorpion can go without food for about a year. How amazing is that? So I'm sure that they eat as much as they can in the rainy seasons to try and save up fat reserves. And well then, when there is a lack of insects during the harsher conditions, the drier months, it's not that they're going to be suffering. They're able to continue life like they normally would. Isn't that just amazing? Right, let's see what else we can find though. Let's see what's down on the ground here. Maybe a spider or two. Now, Scram, you're wondering if you've ever been stung by a scorpion before. I haven't. And well, I'm not looking for, forward to the day that I do because that day I think is going to be inevitable. And one day I'll put my hand on something or sit down on something or something like what happened to Jamie the other day where the scorpion fell out of the roof. That's definitely a possibility as well. Now, I saw a moth flying around. I've just got to see where it landed it was and I'm thinking a moth Taylor don't you mean a butterfly but no we get diurnal moths as well and it looked like a speckled footman perhaps but it is now ah I've got it 
Exe, we've got to be very careful because it is very, very shy. So you can see just in there, can you see that little yellow thing? I'm going to get too close, but it's in there. Have you got it? Yeah. Now that's one of the little little diurnal moths and I'm just trying to have a look at the back of it but I don't want to scare it too much. It actually, it, it's one of the footmen. I'm not sure which one but it doesn't look like the speckled footman. I'm going to see if I can get a better view on the other side. No, it's one of them but it will remain a mystery as there are so many different things out and about and the reason why I know that it's not a butterfly it's just that its overall shape looks very moth-like and then of course it's sitting with its wings flat rather than sort of closed together upon its back like the butterflies do. Hello little thing, isn't that amazing? And it's, I just find it incredible every time I go out on a bushwalk what you can find when you just turn over a piece of bark. I'm gonna have a look underneath here. Let's see what's under here. Nothing? Just a couple of bits of grass growing. And you've also got to be careful because this is an opportunity to get stung by a scorpion. So if you don't pick them up very carefully, you could be in a bit of trouble. Oh, there's a helicopter flying overhead, very low. Probably, of course, f doing an anti-poaching patrol, maybe from the Kruger National Park. It looks like a sand park helicopter. Yeah, green. So off it goes to do a patrol and it's very important to do the aerial patrols as well it's quite difficult though and now in the summer months when the, the brush is so thick now speaking of poaching Riley you were wondering this afternoon if this area in South Africa has a problem with illegal poaching and unfortunately it does so with the high density of rhino species well the black and white rhino that we have down in South Africa and uh, of course we've got pangolin which is actually the number one most poached mammal in the world is the pangolin and um, so yes we do get a lot of people coming through uh, there's still a lot of uh, people hunting elephants or poaching elephants for their ivory but that normally happens more in the northern regions of Africa but we are on it and, and especially in this area they're really really good they've employed the most incredibly talented people we've got anti-poaching dogs you saw the helicopter people driving around in vehicles rangers on foot walking around 24 7 spending days in the bush so you you never you know it, you've got to be really really clever to try and get past some of these people and most of the time when there is an incident that people are being caught which is fantastic I know the number of arrests in the last couple of years has skyrocketed so that's really good that they've managed to weed out all the corruption and try and get a close-knit uh, group of people who are really in it for the right reasons and, and the conservation preservation of the wildlife and of course not just the animals but of course the flora as well so that's really important now we're going to carry on taking a stroll. I'm probably going to have a couple of sips of water uh, as it feels as though I've got a leather flip-flop in my mouth at the moment. It's very warm out here. So I'm going to send you all the way across to Cheetah Plains to see how that wonderful leopard is doing. Well, we're still sitting with young Vutomi. Tony Two-Step successfully made his escape and the wind is suddenly picked up. So you can see it's still quite warm even though the wind's picked up. He's popped himself in a lovely bit of shade while he awaits his mother's return. Oh Tony, don't get spotted again. Oh, he's a very, very good looking little boy. He's a little nick on his nose, nothing serious though. And remember his spot pattern from this morning is a 3-4. There he is trying to bite offending flies. He might go for a drink. This is why if you've got the opportunity, young male leopards, 
you stick with them. They're always up to stuff. Not always, as we found out yesterday after spending hours with very flat cats, but it is always worth taking that chance, spending the time, playing the patience game. Well, well done, Annabelle. Annabelle says uh, whenever she finds a cat, she will uh, donate $10 to Panthera. Now, I've got to do a bit of Panthera work just now. It's not going to be pleasant, Annabelle, but I will do it as well. Can we see it from here, Vim? I think we might be able to. There's a very large dropping for such a small cat that I need to go collect a, a sample of so we can send it to Panthera. It's somewhere around there. I think it's behind the tree. But yes, I will be collecting some leopard scat for that Panthera project. Um, for those of you who are not sure about it or don't know about it, um, so we collect scat for genetics. Uh, on the leopards, there's two different reasons. There's a there's a research project going on to figure out the genetic per per parentage of the male leopards in the area. So of course it's very easy to tell who mom is, but it's near impossible to tell who dad is without genetics. And I know a lot of people think they can tell uh, who the dad is by the shape of their face or their spots or whatnot. But uh, apparently, according to the Panthera scientists, that is almost always incorrect. Because female leopards will mate with so many different male leopards uh, before they have cubs to try convince all the males in the area that they are the father, uh, the only way to really tell who the daddy is, is by genetics. Now, that is a small side project. The main project for the Panthera, oh, he's gonna walk out this there, yeah. um, the main project is to do with the uh, to skin a cat program. Now there's a, a church in KwaZulu-Natal called the, the Shembe Church where they traditionally wear zebra, I mean not zebra, leopard skins uh, all over them uh, and unfortunately a lot of leopards have ended up being used in the skin trade. So the genetics is to find out where these leopards are coming from uh, to try identify where the problem areas from a conservation point of view are. And uh, out of, I think it was about 10,000 skins tested that were from uh, the Shembe Church, uh, I think it was, there were at least eight or nine different leopards that had uh, genetic markers which proved them to be relative to uh, leopards from the Sabi Sands. And uh, unfortunately the vast majority comes from a part of the world where I actually spent quite a bit of time and saw a few leopards. So the area that's been heavily hit by the skin trade for leopard skins is uh, northern Mozambique and southern Tanzania. And uh, the program is busy replacing real leopard skins with synthetic leopard skins. A bit, which gap? That one. Oh, back a tiny bit. Oh no. I'll hold the branch. How's that? Now I'll keep the branch out of the way so you can see him nicely. So that's Panthera, uh, an incredible, incredible organization. Now, I was lucky enough as a child to spend quite a lot of time with the now head of Panthera, Dr. Luke Hunter. He was doing cheetah research um, on the reserve Pinda that my dad is one of the founders of.
such a beautiful male leopard. You can see the white under the eyes there to try and catch any ambient light when he's out in the dark hours. Doing a little bit of preening. Now I really hope his mom comes back. Oh, get that fly. Now I know a lot of you, uh, in this included, would love to get hold of uh, that Panthera documentation and share their findings. The findings will become public, but uh, for those of you who have not been involved in the scientific community before, uh, it has to go through a long lengthy process before those that information can be made public. Uh, it, some of that information is now sitting with peer review, so a bunch of professors etc will have to go through it see if they think the science is valid the genetics is correct and this this is a very long lengthy process but as soon as it is available they will make that information public and trust me we will be on the, some of the first people to receive it Hello Lucy. Lucy would like to know, how do leopards know who not to mate with or is incest not a big problem? Well, Lucy, the, the way leopards make sure that they don't get too much incest, because incest, incest in wild cats does happen, uh, in most cases they can sort of inbreed for a couple of generations, up to sort of four or five, before there are any real big genetic defects that are, are visible. Now, the dispersal of males is how they ensure that. So as soon as a young male gets to that two, two and a half years old, uh, his father will no longer, or the dominant male in the area, will no longer tolerate him um, around near the mother or in wherever they find him. And they will chase and attack him. And, and then often that can cause the leopards to move up many many kilometers away from their natal home ranges the natal home range being where they were born and so by the time they're big enough at about five or six years old to challenge a male for this territory and start mating they are often far far away from their natal home range that is not obviously always the, tr the true but I know from one panthera project they darted some dispersal males in Zululand on Pinda. One male made it all the way to Kruger. It's over 400 kilometers that that male dispersed. Oh, he's having a war with the flies. What's he up to now? Silly, that's in the sun. Very pretty there. Oh, beautiful light as he turns around. I hope you guys are getting some screenshots. Remember, share them with us. Hashtag Safari Live or Quest oh. <laughs> on Twitter or pop them on our Facebook page which is Safari Live or on when many of the wonderful groups that you guys have started on Facebook. And he's slowly making his way towards the pan where we found him this morning so maybe he might head for a little afternoon drink. I got a feeling he's going to lie down a couple of times before he gets there. There we go, on cue. Uh, 
Uh, we're gonna keep sitting with young Vutume while we do that. Let's go see what Effe is up to back on Juma. Welcome back. We are on one of the boundary roads heading up to Sydney's dam. There was reports of wild dogs approaching our area, so we're really keeping our fingers crossed. We're gonna go take a chance, take a look. It's been a very hot day, so I don't think they would have moved much, but you never know. It's gonna still take us a while to get to the dam and see if they, they come through for a drink. Maybe there's some prey species there, impala or something that might get their attention when they start moving. So, yeah, other than that, we haven't seen much after the lions. We'll, we'll keep moving, keep looking around, scanning the area, see what else wants to pop out. Maybe we bump into some elephant on the way, who knows? Jimmy in Texas, you would like to know what my favorite animal is. I don't have a specific favorite. Uh, I enjoy a couple of different species, maybe a little bit more, but I can't say that one stands out as a favorite. I really enjoy black rhino. The big cats are always entertaining to watch and spend time with. Uh, so, yeah, I would say those, those three, probably stand out as as the top ones but every time you're out in the bush and you spend some time you have memorable sightings with various different ones um, a couple of days ago oh no it was yesterday morning we had an amazing in encounter with impala well, that will stay in the memory bank for a long time uh, fe two females pushing each other around at first and then the female going over to one of the younger ones and pushing that around and there's many other examples of that there is a bit of corrugations on the road it is one of the main roads in the area and it's utilized a bit more so unfortunately there's nothing we can do for the moment um, so just bear with us as we bounce around a little bit. I'm going to speed up a little bit, see if we can minimize the bouncing. Folks, while I get into a little bit of a better area with the road, we're going to head over to Taylor for an update on the bushwalk. Searching far and wide for all sorts of things to find you, but everything just keeps evading us at the moment. So you'll have to come on a little bit of a walk as Herbie leads us through a safe path. Now, when you're walking in the bush, Eggsy, you have to watch out for this tree. Eggsy's got a big an antenna coming out of his head, so we'll go a slightly different route. You're right there. Oh, he's just got to tilt his body. So it's always good to try and find a nice clear route that you can sort of see on the ground. Make sure you're not walking through any leaf litter because at this time of the year, you wouldn't want to stand on a puff adder and there'd be very much camouflage. But we're turning over a couple of logs. What do you have, Herbie? A sp can you see a spider? Oh, okay, there it is. Come have a look here, Eggsy. Might see a kill. There's a little cricket over there. Can you see the cricket? Just on this bit of bark. Can you see it there? Yeah. Now, there's actually a spider hidden in over here. Come on. You can coax it out. Look at this. Look, 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 look. Can you see that big spider sitting there? Now, I don't know what type of spider this is. It looks like it could be a young velvet spider. 
just because of how sort of um, robust the body is and, and the big sort of rear end on it. It could turn into a, a velvet spider. It's a little bit small to tell at the moment, but something like this would have caught that cricket if it had come too close. You can actually see it looked like it was starting to burrow down just in this little hole here. And a lot of these spiders, the velvet spiders, and of course the um, wolf spiders and things, they don't really make webs. They just sort of make burrows into the ground and they'll actively hunt rather than trying to trap their prey. And then look who else we've got crawling around. The tiniest little millipede you ever did see. You better be careful, there's lots of spiders and we just saw a scorpion too, little millipede. Now, millipedes are incredible little creatures. I'm, I'm a huge fan of them. And it's something that we actually haven't re I, I don't know, maybe the other guides have spoken about it, but I always seem to forget it for some reason. And um, when a millipede is born, it's only born with two pairs of legs on its segment. So it hatches from an egg and it basically is a, a little replica of, uh, of the adult. So it looks very much like what you just saw. And then after its first molt, it gets another segment and another two pairs of legs. So a millipede might not even have a thousand legs like the name suggests. So they reckon that the millipede with the most legs that has ever been found only had 750 legs. Can you believe that? Nowhere near a thousand, quite far off the, the 1,000 mark. The sort of average amount of legs that a millipede will have is anywhere between 250 and about 500. So even though the name suggests that it's got a thousand feet, it doesn't necessarily have to. But Exy, are you ready to climb over this log? Exy said he's going to try his best. We'll do one big loop over. <laughs> Exy's going to do a run up. I think you should film yourself going over. <laughs> right. Oh, we're near, we're actually near Wahlberg's Road. Well, I think we're about to go on to Wahlberg's Road. Now, Alana, who's age 13, was wondering about the differences between butterflies and, and moths. Now, there's quite a few differences, but some of the easy ones is that when you're looking at a moth, most of the moths have sort of feathered antennae. So there's things that stick out of their heads, and it, it looks like a small feather, really, where butterflies have clubbed antennae. So that's one of the main differences. And then, of course, normally when a butterfly will sit at rest, it puts its wings behind its back like that and whereas a moth will typically sit with their wings out and because moths are predominantly diurnal, they've got much better camouflage than the butterflies. The butterflies are normally brightly colored. Sometimes that indicates that they're toxic, but the moths are generally, generally not brightly colored at all. Because they're flying around at night, there's nothing really to spot them. So they've got these beautiful blacks and browns and little bits of whites and, and all sorts of things on their bodies and helps them hide away better at nighttime. Now we're gonna just try and keep up with her. Ooh down there. We've managed to spot an impala and a beautiful impala ram. He's looking at us, probably wondering, what are you doing in my territory? This is my land and hopefully we don't get chased around like the one chased us this morning because I don't know if I can run as fast as they can and I wouldn't like a horn in the bum. That wouldn't be very nice. Eggsy, would you like a horn? Mm -hmm. Nope, they're very sharp tips. <laughs> so we probably won't bother him and we'll let him go that way and we shall go the other way. And we'll see what else we can find on this journey down this way. But for the moment, until we find something else to show you, we're gonna go back across to that beautiful leopard and see what he's up to. One. There we go, look at this, he's come for a drink. Just as we predicted, as it's got a little bit cooler, he's moved. And look at all the algae that's popped up over the day as the oxygen's got into it. This is exactly where we found him this morning. Oh, he's a little broad-banded yellow butterfly that was fluttering about him. Isn't that exquisite? Hope you guys are getting fantastic screenshots in this golden African light. Oh, he's making me feel thirsty. 
Look at that. Look at those gorgeous eyes. Such a good looking young mo young boy. <laughs> Off again? Where are you leading us to next, Vitomi? Oh, there's a tree behind me. A bush, rather. some nice deep shade up ahead. You might be heading for another snooze. Here we go. CE is wondering who is the mother of this young male leopard. It is my favorite leopard in the northern Sabi sands, in Kanyeni. So she is my favorite and that is that mother. She was sister, half-sister to Shaluva 2005. Her last litter consisted of the two cubs that survived to adulthood. One Shaluva 2013 and a Makombo. I think were their two names. Now, we often try put uh, human ideals and emotions uh, into into wild animals but we must remember they are wild animals wild being the operative word now green eyes is asked do I think that they will remember leopards will remember their offspring uh, when they get older I would say to a degree not not in the, the sort of human way we would like to think now uh, so we've seen Shadow and Karula actually growl and snarl at each other on, on their boundary and that's mother and daughter. Once those, they become independent of their mother, uh, they will fight, they'll try to keep their mother out of the territory that their mother even gave to them. Uh, maybe there's some form of recognition, but I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a conscious one. It'll be a, a sort of an instinctive genetic coding that the female will know that her genetic code is still being passed on by that individual. Oh, look at that. Gorgeous. He's heading straight towards us. Here's a nice termite mound you might want to go sit on. And we can see all the butterflies that are appearing around him as he walks through the lamb's tail. Oh, he's found a nice little hole to sleep in. All right, let's try and move around again. Of course, he, even in his little mini adventures around here, he's not normally going to go more than about 500 meters from where his mom told him to wait. Now, I'm not sure, I didn't see any tracks of her this morning, so I'm not sure where she's hunting, but hopefully it is on Cheetah Plains. Look at that. He's got himself right down in that little hole. How's that for him? Hey, 
Hey, look at that. That's a good comfy spot. And you can see the lamb's tail, string of stars, the heliotrope flowers about all around him. Very pretty picture. Oh, he spotted a bird of prey by the looks of things. And you see a big cat look up into the sky like that. Could be a battalier, could be a vulture. Now, Lady Lone Wolf is wondering what his name means. And it's not a nickname, it is his name. He's over a year old. Um, his name is Vutomi. And I didn't give him that name. Shanae from Inkoro and her tracker did. It means life. They thought he was dead so many times, but he kept coming back to life. So they decided to call him Life. So this is Vutomi. Oh, we just had a, a visitor land in the vehicle. A dung beetle went, there he goes. There we go, hello little dung beetle. I always find them so fascinating because they still haven't mastered the art of landing. They just close their wings when they think it's time to land. See his little antennae there. Now, testing the wind, he's trying to find out where that dung he was looking for was before he flew into me. Oh, it's getting ticklish for him. <laughs> I'm being tickled by a dung beetle. Oh yeah, I'm going to release Dung Beetle to go find some dung. So while him and I say goodbye, it seems like Taylor has turned arboreal. Um, <laughs> I can't be serious. This is me attempting to meditate, but it's not really. Now I've climbed up to the tallest of tall trees, as you can see. And what I thought I'd do this afternoon is that I've always wondered how comfortable is it for a leopard to sleep in a tree. So now we're going to try out a couple of positions. If I'm not going to be too ladylike, now I need to hold on. Hold on there. I'm so scared I'm going to fall and hit the ground. Because I always dangle a paw. This is actually not so bad. Let's try a different position. What else do they do, Igzy? Oh, am I key? I'm key. <laughs> I'm talking on the radio. That's, uh, right, that's That one's not so comfortable. What about this one? I'd love to see a leopard doing this on a tree. And then sometimes you get it where they've just, they're dangling like this. And I'm probably cueing my radio. I apologize, Lou. <whistles> right, now are you ready? Ugh. I'm gonna have to try and jump down this really tall tree. I'm worried, I hope my ankle, are you ready for this? Eggsy, yeah. do you think I can do it? This great fall. <sighs> Just jokes, it wasn't that high. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous of heights, so you won't see. No, I like climbing trees, but I need things to hold on. I'm not as nimble as I used to be. Told you I was gonna walk away without my backpack. So there we go, me in a tree pretending to be a leopard. And well, it's actually not as bad as what you think. I thought that it was going to not be very comfortable at all. But that position will let 
too bad and I presume a leopard has probably got better balance than what I do. Well I should hope that a leopard has got better balance than I do. Herbie's just looking at me like I'm crazy. It's fine. It's not the first time he's given me that look. So <laughs> Herbie, we're gonna go to the pan. We're gonna head towards the, the Juma pan and have a look. You'll probably see us on the dam cam again. I'm gonna go have a look around there. Oh, wonderful. Let's go say hello to Evie. I think I can actually see him in the distance. Herbie, we're going to go to the pan and say hello to Evie. I think there's a couple of Impala around there too. I just need... Oh, hang on. We're being, we're being summoned back. What do you have, Herbie? Let's see what he's got first before we go say hello. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Come have a look at I just need to have a close inspection, but it looks like, I don't even know what it looks like. Let's take one off. Let me use my Leatherman. What does that look like to you, Eggsy? Sorry, I'm bumping you. Let's remove one. Worms. It does look like worms, doesn't it? It looks like it's the, the exoskin. Ooh! It flew away. It looks like there was probably some caterpillar or something like that that had left half of its body behind, but a whole lot of them. So maybe they had pupated and that was just, of course, uh, the old skin that they'd, uh, they'd shed. I don't know what that was. Funny looking things. We're going to walk towards Avia now. And maybe we see all those impala, which we saw yesterday. Oh, there they are too, speaking of all the Impala. Now, I have been talking very loudly, so I suspect that the Impala know we're here, but we're downwind of them, so I don't know if they've worked out that we're on foot yet. They could still think we're in a vehicle. So we shall try and sneak over. We're gonna play a game called hide behind all the bushes so the animals don't see you. And we'll see how close we can get before the Impala realize we're here. That means I'm going to start to talk a little bit softer now. Herbie, let's try to sneak up to these Impala and see how close we can get. Herbie's munching on some Bushman's grapes. <sighs> He's hungry, he said this walk was exhausting. So, um, so some of the most important things when you are walking is obviously to have the wind in your favor. That is the best thing. The other thing is then to have a bit of cover between us. And luckily, we've got lots and lots of different shrubs, but the Impala eyesight is so keen that I think they saw me already standing up, up and down on a tree and behaving like a hooligan because now they are moving off into the distance. So our plan failed. The Impala spotted me and it was probably also because I was so loud earlier. Probably thought, what is that ruckus going on back there? But that's okay, we almost did Avia. I'm going to see what he's up to. Oh, got, stick got me. Right. This is so nice and I'm glad that the wind has picked up and the clouds have come over because it actually ended up being a very pleasant afternoon. Here we go, have a look at all these impala now. All the tiny little lambs. But they won't be too worried about us because they know that they can outrun us. Especially those little lambs. They probably haven't seen too many people on foot. But eventually they'll get there. But you can see mom staring straight at us, a couple of males looking at us too, just making sure we don't get too close. And if they do feel uncomfortable, they'll start to dash away. You can see they're moving away slowly, so they're happy with us at this distance. They know that if we were to start running, <laughs> now they're not so sure. Now they've decided no, they don't like us at all. And that's probably because they can't smell us too well either. They're just trying to listen and they can see us. Um, you know what animals are like, they rely on their sense of smell so heavily that it is very important for them to be able to utilize that sense. And if they can't, well, it can make you a little bit on the jumpy side. Oh, I can hear something buzzing in the sky. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Connor's drone. Do we have the bird's eye view yet, Louise? There we go. 
you should see us now popping out of the bushes. Hello, everybody. Ooh. Walking toward <laughs> the stick gate you, Eggsy. We, we almost got a bird's eye view of Eggsy tumbling, which would have been fantastic. That would have gone straight onto YouTube. And here Connor comes buzzing overhead. You should see him go over the top of us in just a moment. And I don't know why Avia is running away from us. I oh, wanted just coming over to say hello to him. And now he's, he's going away. Come back, Avia, come back. <laughs> and you can see the dam quite nicely with all that lovely lush grass coming through. And apparently the most beautiful sunset that's about to happen with the golden light illuminating all the grasses and their inflorescence. It must be an absolute beautiful sight. And we're walking down the road. Exie, are you ready? You've got to do your best model step. Okay, ready? And if you watch us now, Exie and I are modeling. Can you see us modeling? Probably too high, thank goodness. Come on, Exie. Swing those hips. Swing. That's not how you walk down the catwalk. <laughs> <laughs> and we're being ridiculous, of course, as normal, because that's what we are. We are not a normal bunch of people. <laughs> and I've also scared all the Impala away, which I think Evia was hoping to have a look at. And now Evia is watching the drone with his binoculars. This is incredible. I love the drone. I don't know about you, but I just think being able to have a bird's eye view is quite special. You get to see so much that's around you. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna send you across so that you can stop hearing the sound of my voice and hear his wonderful soft tones. Welcome back. What an amazing view, getting a chance to have a bird's eye view of things out in the bush. The first time the drone came over me on a bushwalk a couple of days ago, I got the fright, fright of my life. I thought it was a swarm of bees and I got down on the, <laughs> on the ground. Everyone, Herbie and Darby just laughing at me, what are you doing? So I started pretending to draw something in the ground and then had a look over my shoulder and realized it was the drone. Those Impala have moved off, but hello Taylor. Hello my old friend. How are you? <laughs> Very well, and you? Good. <laughs> Just thought I'd sneak into the shop. And... Anyway, awesome. We're going to carry on trying to find something new. Might go watch the sunset. Hey Taylor. Oh, awesome. Enjoy. <laughs> you taking over yeah? I can do the, I can do the elevator now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let's move on a bit. I spotted some animals in the distance off to the left there's some impala but there were also some baboon in the area i'm going to head around the dam and see if we can get a better view of them so that is why i was checking out the drone with the binoculars as taylor said i'm just making sure it's the drone and not a swarm of bees <laughs> I'm glad to hear everyone enjoying the drone segment and getting a different view of things. Let's quickly shoot across this damn wall and around the corner. Maybe we'll get those baboons again. some impala up ahead. There's a woodlands kingfisher that's just flown off sitting in this. There's a second one coming in. Look at him displaying wings out. Just displaying, showing the other one who's boss. The other one's moved off again. Let's keep going. 
try and catch up to those baboon. I wonder if they've crossed over this road already or they're in this thicket right in front of us. Suzanne, you would like to know what is the one thing I would really like to see in person that I haven't seen on Game Drive before? Um, something that I haven't seen in a very long time is pangolin. Something that I've never seen before. Now you've got me thinking. <laughs> sure. What would I really like to see? I'm going to have to mull that around a bit. I'll get back to you shortly, Suzanne. wonder where these baboons have gone. There is a tiny creature that I've only had a glimpse of once and it was on my own, so I don't think anyone would believe me if I saw it. It was a striped polecat down in the southern Savi Sands. Um, one night after hosting dinner at one of the lodges and heading back home, it just ran across the road in front of me. So I don't know if it actually was one, but it would have been pretty cool if it was. And I wouldn't mind seeing that again. Folks, I'm going to keep searching for these baboons. I think they might have given us the slip. But while I, I do that, we're going to head back to Taylor. She is almost ready to say goodbye to you. I don't want to go home. The lady on controller said it's getting too dark for the walk, so I'm throwing a tantrum now. I'm kicking up a storm. No, as sad as I am to go home and we'll just do the dust for effect because doesn't it look beautiful as I walk into the sunset and I've got this cloud of sand. Let's do that, it's amazing. Special effects for what? We've got nature out here to do all these incredible things. But sadly, we are on our way off. You can see Herbie's already halfway home, but it's been a wonderful drive. And I hope you all enjoyed my ridiculousness this afternoon. But we'll catch you in the vehicle for the sunrise safari. But just myself and Herbie, we're gonna head you, we're gonna send you back across to Avia and hope you find those baboons. It looks like those baboons gave us a slip. We did take a bit of a detour on our way to Sydney's dam. I didn't forget about that. We just went past um, Juma Dam, had a look at a bit of the Plains game and the Impala around that area. And just to give the possible wild dogs a bit of a chance to, to get more active as it's cooling down gradually. Um, we are gonna make our way in that direction. and hopefully we'll get some activity in that area. Let's keep our fingers crossed that those wild dogs want to grace us with their presence. It would be exceptional.
Catherine, you would like to know if the polecat is like a skunk. They look very similar. Like also got the mostly black on their body and a bit of white markings, white lines running along the, the back towards the, the hind quarters. I don't know if they have the similar defense mechanisms as skunks have, making that foul smelling gas when they feeling threatened. I don't know much about these polecats because they so seldomly seen. It is definitely something to look up at up and see if we can find a bit more information on them. There's a bird of prey flying in front of us. On a quick glance it looked like a Warburg's eagle. We'll have a quick look, see where it perches and then we'll get a closer look at him. Straight into the sun, I can't see where it's gone now. Where's that Warburg's eagle gun? Lynn, you would like to know if any of us as guides have ever come across poachers. I personally haven't. I'm not sure about the other guys, if Brent or Taylor has. Um, but I do know some people that have in, in some more remote areas um, that they've bumped into them. Luckily no harm came to any of the people that were with them or the guides themselves. They were able to call it into the authorities and the authorities took over. The guides moved out of the area and let the right people handle them and follow up on, on what the guys were doing in the area. It's definitely not something that I ever want to experience is bumping into those guys. Um, especially if I have people with me, it wouldn't be an ideal situation. I think, let's keep moving. Let's get up to Sydney's dam and go have a look there. Elana 13 you would like to know who is in the big five so we've got two cats which is lion and leopard and then we've got three big herbivores which is black rhino or oh, rhino elephant and buffalo Folks, while I keep making my way over to Sydney's, we're gonna head over to Brent and see what he's got of one of the hairy and scary ones. Welcome back, and he's he's turned his his back on us, young Vatumi. I'm not sure how comfortable that is as a snoozing position, and we'll see how it long long it lasts. He is a Quite a busy, busy body this evening, scurrying about, terrorizing tortoises.
Oh, oh, their head's getting heavy. Oh, no, up again. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if his mom appeared out of the bush? We would see him become very, very boisterous very quickly. I do love the greeting ceremonies that happen between leopards, or a leopard female and her cubs when they haven't seen each other for some time. Oh, there's the heavy head. And it's news time. Who needs a pillow when you've got a paw? So even though he is snoozing, watch those ears, they're still alert. He's still listening to his surroundings. Little radar dishes. He can't seem to get comfortable. Oh, <laughs> shame. <laughs> it's almost like his mom, I'm bored now. Where are you? I've played with the tortoises, I've had a drink. Hello, Eric in Michigan. Now, Eric is wondering, how long have we been able to get this close to uh, leopards in this area? How many generations have been raised around the sort of safari activity? Okay, well, the first safaris in the Sabi Sands started in the 60s, just to the south of us. But even then, the leopards weren't relaxed. I'd say they only really became truly relaxed in the 70s. And if you look at a average lifespan of so probably four or five generations of leopards have been very relaxed around safari vehicles now if you had to do it from scratch how do you habituate a leopard now there's quite a few different tricks of the trade and I've fortunately uh, done quite a bit of leopard habituation in lots of different places. I've done it in Zambia, I've done it in Tanzania, I've done it in Botswana, and I've even done it in South Africa. There are places here where leopards are not habituated. And the big trick is perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. It's always made easier if you find a female with cubs and you just track them on foot till you keep finding them. And one of the big tricks that I used to do, and it works the same with lions, leopards take a little bit longer than lions. Lions, normally you can get lions really habituated in about four months from running from a vehicle when they see it. Leopards probably take six to eight months depending on the terrain. So my favorite trick is if you find a leopard kill, if you find a female leopard's den site where she's left her cubs, is you drive an, a vehicle, where you drive two cars up there, you stop at about a 100 meters, 75 meters away, you leave the car there and you get one of those old school radios you can buy for nothing in uh, the little local electronic shop and you put the BBC One on. And well, it doesn't matter, any radio station where it's talking. So no music, just constant talking. And, uh, and you just leave that near a kill site, but far enough away, eventually, after a couple of weeks of doing it at different kill sites and what, the animals get used to the sound of the talking and of a vehicle. So every week you'll move it to 10 meters closer, but still leaving no people in the vehicle. You just pull out, leave the vehicle there. And then normally, as I said, it takes for six to eight months with leopards before they are completely completely relaxed. And the trick about relaxing cubs is the cubs will relax the mother. Relaxing an adult male leopard from scratch is a, is a big challenge. It can actually take a year and a half, two years even sometimes. Um, but we, we've already made progress with our unrelaxed male that we see in the north. Uh, Mr. Gajima Veerman was with me for that. Um, it took us about four hours to get 
relatively close uh, to him, close enough that we could get a good view. But again, a lot of the unrelaxed animals, the best habituation work is done at night. So at night, it's a different animal. They feel far more comfortable. During the day, an unrelaxed leopard will bolt, where there is a relaxed leopard will not even acknowledge the click of my fingers, like this young gentleman. has given us tons of fun this afternoon and like uh, he wore himself out while it was hot and now while it's cool where he's supposed to be jumping about he's snoozing Hi, David in Napa, California. Uh, David would like to know, do these animals have the same core body temperature as humans or do they run slightly higher? They run slightly higher uh, than we do, David. And of course, they are far more affected by, uh, especially an upward turn of temperature in their core body uh, than we are. So we, we are a little bit more resilient to fluctuations in body temperature than uh, the big cats. Now, now, for a big cat, if its body temperature raises by even one and a half degrees, it can be Celsius, that is, not Fahrenheit, it can be life-threatening. Now, he didn't really come in danger of doing that today. Uh, even though it was hot, it wasn't really hot. Oh, 95, I suppose. It depends on your definition of really hot. I only think it's really hot when it's about 115. Till then, it's, it's warm to moderate. And I'd much rather be warm to moderate uh, and really hot than really cold. Now we're faced with a little conundrum. I'm quite tempted to take a little trundle down towards the Cheetah Plains pan, but he might move. Now, Marcy would like to know, can the animals get sick from drinking that dirty water we saw him drinking? Well, Marcy, you and I could probably drink it and not get sick. Uh, it's not that dirty, it's just got a bit of elephant feces and stuff in it and some algae. Uh, other than that, it's, it's, it's quite clean. It's probably cleaner than most rivers that run through big cities. Uh, and they, it is their only water supply. They can't pop down to the local, local shop and buy a bottle of water uh, or open a tap. So that water is perfectly fine for them. It, it probably doesn't taste too nice to us. But I've drunk water far worse than that when I've needed to and I'm still standing. Barely, but still standing. Unlike young Votomi, who's very much for, oh, for a flat cat. So while I ponder whether to take a trundle down to the Cheetah Plains pan, I just worry he gets off the top of his termite mound while we do that. And let's go see what's happening back on Juma with FW. Welcome back. We have been to Sydney's, I think it was a bit of wishful thinking on my side, hoping that the wild dogs would show themselves. Um, we've decided to move on. We're going to head past Biffles Hook Dam, see if there's any activity in that area. And then I think we should go back to those lions just after sunset and see what they are up to, if they are getting a move on or if they're just sleeping. The only exciting thing we saw at Biffles Hook, uh, at um, Sydney's was a Swainson's Franklin 
I think you saw one on the birding challenge with Brent the other day. Melissa, you would like to know where I am from. I grew up in the northwest province of South Africa. It's about an eight hour drive from where we are now, about three hours west of Johannesburg. Grew up on a farm, nice, yeah, nice growing up in the country. And yeah, it's living a childhood or a child's dream growing up in open spaces and having a lot of fun out in nature and on the farm with my dad and with my grandfather. Natasha, a very, very good question. You would like to know if hyenas hunt for food as well, or if they only steal food from other predators. They are very good hunters, and in some areas where there's maybe a little bit less lion in, in that area, they become the apex predator, and they hunt very effectively. I've heard in an area a little bit further north of here, there's a Ahina pack that, um, or Ahina clan, that hunts more than the lions there. Um, they don't see lion too often in the area, but often when there are lion kills, the Ahina just never show up because they've got enough food of their own. They catch it and they carry on. quite interesting how things work when animals move around and the dynamics change when there's a certain amount of one species the others kind of move out of the area to do their own thing there's a lot of competition be all, between all the be, between all the predators and they try and avoid each other they don't really want to spend too much time in one another's company I was unfortunate and to an extent fortunate to see a very hectic interaction between two predator species. It was interaction between lion and leopard. Unfortunately it didn't have the happiest ending or not a happy ending at all. The female leopard got killed by a male, by a male and a female lion. They were chasing her around for a while and we, we spent time with them and eventually she ran from tree to tree, sitting up top in the tree, next thing jumped down and bolted off again into the next tree and the lions figured out what she was doing. So she came down one, one last time and unfortunately the lions were ready and waiting for her. It was a, it, it's one of those sightings that is just built into your memory but the helplessness that you do feel you can't do anything you don't want to get involved and you just sit and watch this thing unfold it is a very sad thing I was left speechless for minutes after that I just told the guest I don't know what to tell you you get to grow a bit of a bond with certain animals in an area that you spend time in and then that animal is just taken away like that so it's yeah, very very sad
James, you would like to know if I've got a favorite leopard in any of the reserves that I worked at before. Um, I worked at Sabi Sabi Game Reserve in the southern Sabi Sands. Um, I made mention of that yesterday with the lions as well. Um, there was a female leopard called Notten, ah, sorry, not Nottens, the Lisbon female. She had this very interesting way of hunting. She would walk through long grass and sit upright like a meerkat. And there was a guy that worked there with me. He'd been there for over 30 years. He basically opened the, the lodges there. And we were in a sighting together and he saw that for the first time after spending many years with that particular leopard. So that's one of the, the leopards that do stand out for me. There's another female that had a very catchy attitude, quite a little aggressive lady um, called the Little Bush Female. And she used to hang around one of the camps um, called Little Bush Camp and that's how she got her name. But she wasn't always that fond of our presence and she would often give you a snarl and look at the tracker in a funny way. So those two leopards for me definitely stand out as two of the favorites that I've had the privilege of spending time with. Let's keep going, let's try and get to Buffalzook Dam. Folks, while we move and make our way through this drainage line and towards Buffalzook Dam, we're going to head over to Brent and see what that beautiful leopard is up to. Well, he seems to have found a slightly more comfortable spot now in that between two of the pinnacles of the termite mound. Some squawking magpie shrikes attracted his attention there. Oh, <laughs> I can't help it. I'm going to take one picture. It's just too nice. And it's amazing. As soon as I'm off here, he, he closes his eyes and doesn't move. He's performing for all of you out there. I'm really hoping now as it gets a little bit cooler, a little bit later, that mom appears out of the bush. Now the chances of him still being here on tomorrow's sunrise safari are very, very slim, but I think it's definitely worth taking a chance. Yes, I like you, mister. Ooh. Oh, squirrel's alarming down the road from us. Could mom be about to be arrived? You see how he reacted? And I did as well. I did the same thing. Head up, looking down the road. Isn't Kanyeni coming? Oh, and he heard a squirrel and thought, hmm, time to chase it. But it was a bit far. Hello, Eric in Michigan. Eric's wondering, at what age are leopards able to fend for themselves and hunt, permanent, uh, hunt completely self-sufficient from a female? And again, it's one of those strange ones that depends on the individual. Now, the youngest recorded male leopard being independent, and that was forced independence because his mother got killed by lions, uh, was nine months old, and he survived to adulthood. Uh, but that is abnormal. So I would have to say, based on that abnormal, uh, it's nine months. So at this age, they are still able to catch lots of little things, enough to survive. But the big threat comes, especially if their mother has been killed, is probably from another adult female coming into the area. So even at this age, he probably would not be able to defend himself against a female leopard who attacked him. Now, the biggest threat to young Vutomi is a leopard who's a firm favorite of a lot of us out there, and that's Mr. Quarantine. Uh, Quarantine does spend a lot of time in this area, and he is a direct threat to Vutomi. He would definitely try kill this cub if he got the opportunity to. 
So listening to squirrel alarm calls could be mom, could be danger. So it pays to be observant and alert out here. I think that squirrel wasn't a proper alarm call. I think it was just more of a chitter chatter. Maybe having an argument with another squirrel. Squirrel's still chitter chattering. It doesn't sound like that really excited chitter alarming at a leopard. And he doesn't look nearly as interested in it as he was when he first sort of just caught it on the wind. Now as his mom arrives We'll probably hear her calling before we see her, and he probably will hear her calling before we even hear her with that wonderful little ow, bow, bow, that a female leopard does. I don't want to do it too well, you know, don't want to confuse the poor lad. But also chuffing, that sort of huffing and blowing of their cheeks. And uh, leopards and tigers are the only two big cats that chuff. And only when they're in close proximity, and that chuffing is normally between a female and her young, although it has been recorded uh, between adults, but very, very rare. He's so comfortable, I'm quite jealous. Oh, Cyan is wondering whether the spot pattern between the two eyebrows of the leopard be more unique uh, than the spot pattern above the last whiskers. Uh, it's possibly more unique but at a quick glance or if you only get a chance to snap a quick photograph it's far far harder, far more, more spots to count. So quite often in certain times and especially off camera traps and stuff like that you're not going to get a, f a frontal shot of the leopard, you're only going to get a side on shot. So there's a, there's a reason why that top line of spots is the most frequently used. I'm trying to remember, do I have... only Vitomi on this card. That's a pity. My, I, I sent my... actually we can try it. It's not going to be the best, but let me just try this quickly. Unfortunately, my 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 telephonic device uh, went for a tumble, and my spare telephonic device has also been for a tumble or two. Okay, let's have a look. Let's do a little little trick or a little comparison quickly for Cyan. And I mean, it's not the best. Let me find the right picture here. Huh? Where's the one from now? Okay, there we go. So, I mean, if you see what I mean, as soon as it, it's fine when you've got time, but if you look quickly, I mean, see what I mean? It just depends on which direction they're lying. It's very difficult. Can I go closer on this one? Let me just, sorry. No, it doesn't want to stay closer. Maybe if I do it this way. There we go. So, you see what I mean? It just depends on the angle that they're lying. Now, 
this is a fun game. I do apologize for the completely cracked screen I'm showing you here at the moment. But if you see what I mean, it's so difficult at a quick glance to see the difference between that and that. It depends if his eyes are closed, it depends if his if his snarling, if his face is scrunched up, but was with the spot patterns you can see it immediately. But now, just based on that, let's see how good you guys are. Which leopard is that? I'll be super impressed if anyone can tell me without seeing the top bottom row of spot pattern, which young male leopard is that? And if you know the answer, hashtag Safari Live and uh, questions at wildearth.tv on email. If you can tell me which young male leopard that is, I I won't eat my hat, but I'll think about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's a good test. So there's a, a reason we use those. Now on massive sort of camera trap projects and things like that, uh, there has been software developed that can take the whole body side of, of a of a leopard and run it through a computer program and, and that works for that but if you're out in the field and you need a quick ID and uh, the spot patterns generally the best that sort of last line of spots above the whiskers so I'm very I'm so excited to see if anyone can get which young male leopard that was now already in is it Hosanna it is not Hosanna see and uh, I chose that picture specifically um, because it is of a leopard between, uh, I can't remember now, but 10 months and a year old. And David, uh, David, you are correct, it is young Sindile, but I think you got there by a process of elimination rather than the fact that it was the forehead spots. Uh, yes, it was young Sindile at about the same age as this. So just before he had to go away into quarantine. So that's why I specifically chose that picture. Uh, it, it was ex almost exactly the same age. Now we're going to sit here with this leopard hoping his mom is going to arrive. While we do that, let's go have a look at another gorgeous setting of the African sun. While you've been with Brent, we have been enjoying a magnificent low felt sunset. <laughs> In the area that we're in at the moment there are some vultures as well just to the right of us we'll get to them now let's just have a look at the sunset and then we're gonna go over to the vultures um, there's quite a bit of vultures around so it might be a good thing to come and have a look at tomorrow morning there might be something in this drainage line that um, could give us an, a nice surprise in the morning, see what what is around. It is such an amazing sunset. Look at the color in the clouds and all the different colors coming out. There's a nice silver lining on the big cloud just to the right of the <clears throat> of the sun. The end of another beautiful day in Africa. I hope you are having some gin and tonics back home looking at this beautiful sunset. Let me go forward a bit more. There's, there's some more just to the right that we might get a bit of a better view on. There we go. Settling down for the night. Looks like it's all white-backed vultures. All the other trees that have vultures in them, I think they're all white-backed vultures as well. While the light, while we still have a little bit of light, we're going to try and get back to those lions before it's dark. See if we can get a quick update on what they are up to before we leave them for the night.
Imani, you would like to know what we do if we find an injured animal. Now, if it is a natural injury, let's say two Impala rams were fighting and the one got injured, we will not get involved. It is nature, we let nature take its cause and let it carry on. If there was any human influence in it, then we will definitely try and help the animal. So it's, it's all kind of what we see and what we think happened and then we deal with it from there. You would always like to leave nature to, to do its thing, but in some cases you have to help. So it is also a little bit species related in my opinion as well. Even if it's, let's say, a rhino has gotten, gotten an injury, it is a threatened species. So we need to help each and every one of them. And there you'll definitely try and do your best to save it. Just hold on here, yeah. we're gonna get a couple of bumps. I know it is always tough to to see any animal that is injured but it, it, it sometimes you have to put the emotions away and and kind of deal with it in a way to to understand it is survival of the fittest the strongest genes need to go on and all injuries to an extent is a sign of weakness um, and yeah, we have to support nature in that way. Folks, I'm going to have to put my foot down a bit and get moving towards those lines. We're going to head back to Brent and see if that leopard is getting active. Oh, he's just turned his back on us, so we're going to have to tootle around the termite mound. But, fortunately, we will move a bit faster than two-step Tony the tortoise. Um, how's that, Vim? So, it looks like he's going to rest up here for the next while till his mom comes. It's a, it's a great spot. He's got a little pan of water close by. He's got a nice termite mound where he can survey his domain. Well, his domain for now. And see any potential threats before they get to him. And it looks quite comfy up there compared to the rest of the spots he's been trying to nap today. Hello, Michael in the cold north of Canada. Uh, Michael would like to know, who has better eyesight in low light, lions or leopards? I would say they're probably comparable, Michael. Their, their eyes are, are quite similarly designed. Now, I must remember lions and leopards do not see in color. They also don't see detail. A lion or a leopard wouldn't be able to read the Sunday newspaper, for example. Um, they say see in sort of shades of gray, white, and black. And their eyes are very specifically designed to pick up movement. And uh, that's why there's that old adage when out in the bush, and it works for most animals, elephants and rhino and uh, buffalo and hippo are sort of an exception to the rule because they're just cantankerous. But it is whatever you do, don't run. Uh, you stand still, and if you keep still enough, sometimes the animals will lose sight of you. Now, of course, when they're that close <laughs> that they're charging you on foot, uh, maybe not, but it still works to stand still. If you flee, you are acting like a prey. But I'd say that their, their, their eyesight is pretty comparable. Uh, I would say it's about the same.
if anything lions have a slightly better eyesight and that's for one reason and one reason only it's because they're taller so they are able to see over bushes and, and through over gr certain grass uh, where leopards are a bit shorter so they can't and it's an unbelievable thing and then if you if you spend a lot of time following us on safari live or uh, you get to go on your own african safari one day you'll be there and you'll be following a lion or a leopard oh stretchy stretch uh, and you can see all the impala in front of them, you can see the buffalo, but because they're moving through an area of thick bush and their heads are low to the ground, they don't see them till they're much closer. So that's where some of the other senses come in, like hearing and smell, but eyesight is their primary, primary sense when it comes to locating potential prey. Ah, I heard that as well. Let me just have a quick look. Let me just listen again. Ah, oh, no, here we go. You see it, they're well done, VM. Oh, did he fly? No, oh, there he goes. Oh, is that a little bit to the right? Where that fallen, um, there. A little bit to the left. A little bit up. Oh, it's disappeared. But it was a cesticula that sounded like it had a little alarm call. And that's the type of sign you would hear before mom arrived. I just wanted to double check. You like playing around and around the termite run with us, mister? That does seem to be his favoured spot. He has spent most of his time lying facing in this direction. And there we go, you can see that spot pattern really nice and clearly. Three on the right, four on the left. And a little scratch on the schnoz. And you get a hiding from your mother, or did you put your nose through a thorn tree? Well, hello to one stoner and two cats who would like to know if there are any animals that see in full color like human beings. Indeed, there are, and there are primates. So, and a lot of bird species as well will see in color, and quite a few insect species. Now, the reason that most of those animals need to see in color is especially when it comes to fruit seeing when fruit is ripe uh, whether it's safe to eat and so you'll find monkeys baboons gorillas chimpanzees orangutans um, although strange enough of the cat family uh, domestic cats can't see in full color but they can see a few shades of color which is unusual for the cat family and as far as I know, there's no real obvious evolutionary advantage to being able to see a low in color. Oh, that is stunning. What a beautiful young boy. I think we're keeping him just as entertained as he's keeping us. I love it when you get that little light shine on their eyes. Now if you look carefully, sometimes, oh he's moved, um, on certain occasions we get to see our reflection in the eyes of the big cats and it is, it is quite a fun thing. I don't think it, I'm not sure, do you think we were there? In that ref no, VM disagrees. I I, oh you didn't see. Yes. Oh, there we go. Final control says they could see our reflection in the eye of the big cat. So that is that is quite a special thing. It doesn't happen too often. Steve, Steve says, what if leopards had the tawny coat of a lion and lions had the spotted coat of a leopard? Would it improve their hunting? Uh, oof, Steve, that's a, a bit of an interesting one. So the reason the leopards have the spot is because, uh, spots is because they are uh, in so much more varied habitats than lions. So the spot works in savannah, it works in desert 
and it works in rainforests, whereas the tawny wouldn't work so well in a rainforest. I, I don't think it would make too much difference in terms of their hunting success. And also, the, well, the spots are designed for a solitary cat. If we look at the animal, the, the cats, the big cats that have are heavily marked, striped or spotted, uh, you know, leopards, tigers, uh, and so on and forth, they often will live in jungles and forests, whereas lions live in open savannas. So it's probably not as beneficial to a lion. Also, a lion being a social predator is not as uh, reliant on its camouflage uh, because they work as a team. Okay, let's pop around again. He keeps us playing around and around the termitaria. How's that, Vim? There we go. You like this game? Definitely looking expectantly in all directions for the return of Mother Deer. Nkanyani. Now, Denise is wondering, is it cooler for him to lie on top of a termite mound? Uh, at this time of the day, most definitely the sun is down, the wind's picked up a little bit. Now, if there's a termite mound that's got a lot of deep shade, then yes, it's slightly more of a breeze, but generally any bit of shade will do for the cats, as you would have seen um, with FW and those lions today. It's not that uncommon, if there's not a lot of shade around, that the lions will actually come lie in the shade of our safari vehicles. But at the moment, it's a very pleasant temperature. There's a nice wind blowing through. So I think he's very comfortable up there at the moment. He's still breathing heavily, but he's not panting at the moment. Now, Vito would like to know, do the ladies in Final Control ever get to go out on the safari vehicles with the guides? No, Vito, we must keep them in their place, locked in their office. Who says they're allowed outside? No, I'm joking, Vito, of course. Uh, whenever there is an opportunity, we will take the ladies out. Uh, sometimes after drive or in between drives, and every now and then they do get to sit on the back with us for a safari. Stunning, stunning. Oh, I can hear a uh, wildebeest in the distance. Boom, boom, boom. Well, I wonder if it's my good old friend Gnormus Gnorman the Gnu. Is he having a battle with Normal Norman? Now, for those of you who don't know, there's two big open areas on Cheetah Plains. One has the dominant male that we nicknamed Gnormless Gnorman the Gnu, and his arch rival who lives alongside him on the next open area, who's Normal Norman the Gnu. Now, we're going to leave this little man sitting on top of his term termitaria because I still have one smelly job to do today. And I think a lot of you will remember one of the last times I had to do such a job. Uh, that happened to be, who was it? Mvula, I think. And Mvula was, ha I don't know what was wrong with Mvula's stomach that day, but it was absolutely vile. So before it gets dark, so it's, we're getting there, he's moved far enough away from where he deposited his present for me. Now I need to get my leopard scat collecting kit out. 
Oh dear, I hope I brought all my leopard scat collecting kit. Yes, we go. Leopard scat collecting kit. Uh, I'm going to make my way towards that large deposit made by a little leopard. While we do that, let's go have a look at the antelope around the Juma waterhole. We are with a nice herd of impala. Um, the male impala of the group was chasing everyone around, maybe rounding up everyone to get closer as we are going into darkness, keeping all the troops together, having everyone have a look for possible predators moving and lurking around. Um, yeah, I've tried, I've tried to use Brent's example and do a bit of a Ferrari safari and get to those lions, but we are just, just out of reach. We're not going to get there before, before nightfall. Um, so let's enjoy these impala and just see what they get up to. You can hear a lot of grunting noises again. Everyone calling each other, mums calling babies, getting back together after a day of feeding and moving around. Eric, you are asking about the behavior and the similarities between Impala and the North American white-tailed deer. I unfortunately don't know much about the behavior of the white-tailed deer. Um, I would expect there would be some similarities between the two species, but I, I don't know of any specific ones. at that youngster being silly. Did you see it jumping around? It's quite interesting if we pan across this entire herd and just look at the positions of their heads. You can almost say that there is ones looking in every direction. So there's a 360 degree angle that's being watched and that is one of the very lucky th or good things with Impala. They're very vigilant animals. They're looking all over and always someone on the on the lookout. Some will be feeding, some will have their heads up, scanning the area, making sure there's nothing looking at them. And they're very alert animals. There's one or two. We are just behind a lodge here, behind Juma Lodge, and it looks like there's a little bit of movement in these one or two females looking at the lodge, looking at that movement. So you can imagine it's not going to be easy for any predator to get close to them. A lion or leopard are going to really have to know what they are doing when they try and hunt these guys. Out in the open it's a lot more difficult than a, a thicker area and it's a nice spot for them to be at night out in the open. While we've been looking at the Impala, there's a Nyala that sneaked his way in here. He's about to join these Impala. <laughs> Folks, it has been a lovely afternoon. Exceptional sightings. Um, Darvi, thank you for all the help. It's been a great afternoon to share with you. Folks, have a lovely evening. Enjoy. We're going to head over to Brent who is collecting some poop. Okay. Now, I'm trying to figure out... Here we go. That's exactly where I am. Now I need to get my GPS coordinate. Well, I'll do that afterwards. I think it's going to take a while for me to figure that out. But so I'm filling out a bit of information on the Panthera card here. So this is for Panthera. So I'll do the GPS coordinate a little later. What is the date today? 20, 20th, 20th, I think. Uh, 20th of the 12th, 
2016 individual ID, Vutomi. So, uh, sex, male, and age, 13 and three quarter months. I think we can call it 14. 14 months, okay. So I'll do the GPS coordinates afterwards. It's gonna take a little while. Here comes the smelly part. Uh, VM, you're gonna let me know if I start running over time. So it's quite an impressive leaving for such a small cat. Okay. Toothpick. Now, if you're not an experienced cat, cat scat collector, one should wear gloves. Fortunately, I've been doing this since my teens. So. The skin, we're actually going for the epithelial skins from the, the lower intestine. So that's the skin that we're going to be able to get genetics off. Let's have a look. We don't want a massive piece, but we want a big enough piece. Now that is a massive piece. That's too big. Oh, so smelly. Now, because of all the hair, it tends to be quite sticky. To try, there we go. That's that an ideal. Here's an ideal size. Get back in there. Toothpick, you can stay. <laughs> okay, so there we go. That's how you collect leopard scat uh, without getting any on your fingers. Now, if I did get it on my fingers, I'd have to do a big scrub and I'd probably take some uh, antiseptic uh, stuff out of uh, the first aid kit because inside leopard and lion scat lives some of the most vile and horrible little critters, liver flukes type worms and not the good type of worms or whatnot and not the good type of bacteria. You must realize they have a diet that consists of lots of rotting meat. So we, we're not so good with rotting meat human beings. Uh, so we don't want to really get that in your fingers. And those little parasites can get under your nails and any little scratch of nick you don't even know you have. But okay. Now, how do I do this GPS thing? I think I'm going to need VM's help. VM is far more technically savvy than me. When I used to do this stuff for different research organizations or when I was in Gabon collecting gorilla poo, see I've spent a lot of poo in my life, uh, is uh, what will happen is uh, that I had a proper GPS. I didn't have to use a phone and then I just go meh and then I download it later. But uh, it sounds like Final Control is going to tell me our GPS coordinates because they can see where I am. I think that's what they said. But we are coming to the last minute of the drive. I don't know if they're going to be quick enough though. Stand by. 50 seconds. Panic. Panic. Can final control read GPS coordinates in 45 seconds? And still tell me we're 40 seconds out. That is the question. No, I'm joking. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put the pressure on them. I can hear the panic in the final control. I'm only joking. I can wait till I'm off head to do it, but it's been wonderful from the whole Safari live crew. It's been a blast and we can't wait to see you uh, on the sunrise Safari. I'm going to be walking in the morning. So Taylor and Effie are going to be driving and I'm definitely going to whisper into one of their ears that they should come back here. So from the Safari, live crew, VM and myself, bon nuit, and we'll see you in the morning.